Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of our look at aneurysms. And so we left off before talking about endoleaks. Five types of endoleaks. Type one, proximal distal stent, not in complete contact with the aortic wall. Typically, it's due to diameter if the aorta is too large at the stent landing zone or the gap between the stent and the aortic wall allows for blood to flow into the aneurysm sac because of this lack of match in terms of size. And here's just a very nice example. And you could see, of course, that we do still see type 1 endo leaks, but they're less common because we have better manufacturing. Type 2 endo leak is the most common endo leak seen in up to 20% of patients at the completion of EVARs. The usual culprit is retrograde filling of an aneurysm sac by either a patent IMA or lumbar artery, most commonly lumbar arteries. A spontaneous resolution is noted in up to 60% of these cases by 30 days. Here's just a very nice example of an endo leak. Now you begin to worry about the endo leaks when they're beyond 30 days and also when the native aortic aneurysm is increasing in size. Sometimes the endo leaks are best seen on the arterial phase and sometimes the best seen on venous. Most of the time they're seen on both phases. Sometimes they're only seen on venous phase because they're slow. And you can see here this large aneurysm, endovascular stenting, and this large endoleak. You can see in this case the endoleak is there and the key thing about it is the aneurysm is increasing in size from 7.6 to 8.4 centimeters in a year. So again, repair was done, but an endoleak is causing problems, and you'll need to intervene in all likelihood. Type 2 endoleaks can lead to rupture. Here's a type 2 endoleak. You can see the vessel is getting larger, and you can see the patient had this uh, rupture. So again, it can be problematic in that regard. Another example, look at the size of this aneurysm increasing. There's high density. You can see by the retroperitoneum on the left, displacement of the kidney, again, an active endoleak from type 2 in nature with bleeding by the left psoas muscle. Here it is, again, very nicely shown on the later phase images on those two sets of examples. So, again, type 2, more than half will resolve on their own. Others will continue to enlarge the aorta, and it can lead to aortic rupture, as in this case, an active contrast extravasation. We talk about type 3 endoleaks arising from poor, poor seal between components or frank component separation, so it's often a manufacturing issue, again becoming less frequent. It's often associated with aneurysm sac pressurization and increased risk of rupture. It needs to be treated when found, and it can be treated with either a relining stent for poor seal or aorta you know, iliac devices and fem-fem bypass grafts. So there are different ways of treating it. So here's an example, endovascular stent, non-contrast, the aneurysm size increasing. There it is on the images, and you can see the early phase showing you the patient's large endoleak, which would explain why the aneurysm is increasing in size. Here it is nicely, and you can see the gap where it's coming from. Right in the material is a defect within the stent material just beneath the two sets of components joining. And again, very nicely shown here in the 3D image as well, showing you the leak through the uh, patient's graph material. Uh, here it is with cinematic rendering, nicely showing it to you there and showing it to you here. So again, the close relationship of vessels becomes something you need to look at, but any of the complications of vessels and 3D mapping can become very valuable, particularly on these complex endoleaks um, here's just an example showing you how you can look at that a touch better. And again, seeing the endoleak and the enlarging aneurysm. So again, something very important. Um, these patients obviously have all sorts of increased risk. But again, very nice visualization. Here's another set of images showing you the type 3 endoleak. Type 4 refers to diffuse contrast occasionally. Uh, seen immediately after implantation, it's a reflection of the porosity of the graft material, usually self-limited and now requiring treatment. And type 5 is a refractory occult endoleak. And that means you can't see the reason why the aneurysm is increasing in size post-repair, but you know it is. You can see the aneurysm here is enlarging, 6.9 to 7.1, but there's no obvious endoleak but the aorta is expanding. 
And here you can see one year post embolization, seven centimeters, two years, 7.6 centimeters. And then you can see the follow up. Look what happened the aneurysm enlarged, then eventually um, ruptured. You can see the retroperitoneal bleed present. Patient had post op. Now you see uh, a fem fem graph, just a very nice example. We also talk about looking at the graphs at failures whether it's migration, infolding, tears, or disconnections, or stent fractures are all possibilities. We talk about this example where you see the endovascular stent, and look at the stent several centimeters down. Look at that sharp angulation. The stent obviously failed. It's collapsing on itself. Here are some more of the 3D images very nicely showing that. And you can see as I do a center line tracking, Again, the stent failure. Another example, here was a patient who has a ruptured aneurysm. You can see the blood in the retroperitoneal space on the right, and you can see the patient's endoleak very nicely uh, shown where you see the contrast, and there it's, you see it again, and there it is, and there's this stent. You can see the angulation of the stent, the very sharp margin of uh, greater than 90 degrees, and you kind of know exactly why the stent failed, and you see the sequela of that. You see very nicely here, again, the stent, that very sharp angle, almost 90 degrees between the native aorta and the stent. The stent is failing, and here it is looking at some of the images. So again, it is a challenge to be able to put stents in correctly, and it's a, a challenge really to make certain you have the right stent and you don't have these complications. Another example, here's a non-contrast. Look at the stent into the left common iliac, but look at it when you look at the 3D reconstructions. It basically is compressing itself. The stent has failed. Maybe it's a com combination of migration and uh, failure of the stent material, but a nice example, a very sharp angle. Here it is in 3D in color, and there it is with contrast, and you can see very nicely. So this will need to have reoperation. Nothing very tricky, but just a beautiful example. And again, this shows in a lot of the vascular imaging why 3D imaging is so important to be able to recognize pathologies. Here's again another set of images zoomed up over that region. Another example, patient has an enlarging aneurysm, had stent repair. Okay, look at that stent. Okay, what's happening? The aneurysm's enlarging. Now you see the angulation, the stent is failing. You see some contrast around the stent. You see the involvement of the IVC and the IVC filter. Here it is again, look at that, uh, look at the process. Aorta driving the IVC problem, and you see the contrast. And again, just some very nice visualizations showing you that you can look at in 3D the stent graft and a material and look for changes, in this case, the angulation, which lets you know that the patient has indeed failed. Now, we also mentioned device migration, and that usually is easiest seen by looking at multiple scans, but here's a good example where this, this stent has migrated distally, impacts on itself, and you can see the stent has failed. Sharp angulation, here it is in 3D. And here it is with volume rendering. Again, beautiful example of stent failure. We also talk about other non-leak complications like branch vessel occlusion. And it's very common to see branch vessel occlusion because you cover up small vessels most commonly seen in the kidney. Very nice branch vessel occlusion, lower pole of right kidney. You see the infarct. This example, you see multiple bilateral infarcts because the patient had bilateral small accessory renal arteries. Nicely shown, again, the infarcts. Here's an example of type two with a, with a uh, endoleak and renal infarction. There's a stent in the right renal artery. Now you see the contrast, you see the endoleak, but the stent is now well perfused, and now look at the patient's right kidney. You see the infarct in the upper pole of the right kidney and mid-portion upper pole of left kidney. And again, on the 3Ds, you see the arteries are patent, the renal arteries, that is, with stents in place, but due to the complications, look at the infarcts in the patient's kidneys bilaterally. There's an example of the second renal artery on the left going right to the kidney with the infarct there. So again, um, 
good, very nice example of some of the complications. And again, as I mentioned, stent failure is a complication. At times, it's unexpected, but it's one of the things we typically are going to be looking for. This idea about renal infarcts, a recent article made the point. Studies show an 11 to 35% of patients experience a transient increase in creatinine levels, uh, but under 4% ever require dialysis, and that's following Tevar. Our data shows a gradual mild increase in baseline creatinine in all patients undergoing endovascular stent, regardless of whether or not the patient has a renal infarct. Uh, and so that's just something you are going to see, although the presence of infarct enter after a f endovascular stent is common, it seems to carry little clinical relevance. So it's important to mention it, but no one's going to do anything about it typically, when, particularly when it's segmental like that. Now we also mention on the non leak complications infection, which is rare. Here's the case, you see the stent lower thoracic and abdominal aorta, there's an air bubble to the left, left pleural effusion, consolidation, and fluid. There's the endo leak, there's the air bubbles. When you see air bubbles more than a few days post-op, you gotta be thinking about infection, which indeed this was. And you can see very nicely another example where a stent repair, there's fluid around the stent, there's the lobular collection. Again, infection. Or this case, patient with occlusion of uh, endovascular stent, there's air bubbles. Or this case, aortoenteric fistula is something we speak a lot about. Usually it's to the duodenum. Most commonly patients have had uh, in pancreatitis or duodenitis and the duodenum drapes over the aorta and that causes problems. You commonly will see air in the aneurysmal sac, fluid and stranding and the bowel tethered to the aorta can all happen. Beautiful example here of a lot of air in the aorta with a supreme aortoenteric fistula. Or here another example where you can see the two limbs of the grafts, and then when you look with contrast, you can see the left limb is occluded. Again, you want to look very carefully. This is why some people suggest non-contrast only. We say you got to be a crazy person because all of these complications are easy to see on the contrast-enhanced studies, but often impossible to see without contrast or properly timed contrast, and you can see very nicely here. Or in this example as well, this patient post-EVAR, you can see the inflammation around the patient's aorta. You can see the aneurysmal sac is increasing in size. There's an air fluid level. So again, going to be very, very problematic. So. We don't suspect or we don't expect to see, perhaps is a better way of saying it, endovascular stent infections very commonly, but they can occur. If it's more than a week out and you see air bubbles, you better worry. You can tap the fluid because it goes quickly. Once you have this infection, then it progresses very, very rapidly. And again, here's just an example. Look at the fluid present. Look at that displacement. Eventually, that patient was treated and the patient did all okay. So endovascular stent repair is the name of the game these days. It continues to evolve with newer stent designs, leading to less complications and better clinical outcomes. We need to be aware of the range of patients that we can expect to see in our clinic, from endo leaks to enlarging aneurysms to stent failure, and in a sense, everything in between, because we're looking at congenital possibilities uh, with stent repair, you know, some of the uh, syndromes which make it even more complicated. Uh, some of the syndromes people said like uh, Ehlers the Enlos don't put stents in. Now they are doing some things in that regard. So again, being able to select the right patient population for the stents, being able to judge will a stent fit or not, and then doing post-operative imaging to make sure everything is perfect is where we need to be. So with that, that ends my second part of my talk and we'll go on to another subject just a couple hours away next Monday.